Welcome to the Nemeth Report podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, historian and independent researcher, and I'll be your host. Today's podcast episode will explore the issues of China's global ambitions, how it's related to the climate movement, and the push for a net zero transition. My guest today will be Dr. John Robson, Executive Director of the Climate Discussion Nexus. We live in unprecedented times. Prosperity has increased globally, and more people than ever have been raised out of poverty to live longer, better lives on a greener, cleaner planet. This great prosperity, particularly in Western countries, is due in large part to the ubiquitous use of reliable, affordable hydrocarbons. But it is also due to the rise of market economies and the underlying core Western values of individual freedoms, property rights, the rule of law, and free trade. However, all of these things that allow for greater prosperity are being eroded to the point of collapse. A system change is being proposed, and climate change is being offered as the rationale for the net zero revolution. By forcing an energy transition away from reliable hydrocarbons and pursuing net zero, countries in the West become weaker in every way. China, which has expanded its use of hydrocarbons, has been taking advantage with the goal of becoming the sole dominant global power by 2050. There is a fair amount of deception, dishonesty, and lack of candor surrounding the net zero transition and the true goal of China's global ambitions. What does net zero mean anyway? The definition is so vague, the meaning is left up to individuals to define it as they see fit. Most people believe this means emissions are essentially zero, balanced by offsets or what nature removes. The public is being led to believe that the pathway to net zero is just a gradual swapping of one form of energy for another, that people can keep their cars, they'll just be electric, and little will change in their everyday lives. But this isn't the only meaning or pathway. Many activists, academics, and experts write that net zero means a complete stop in human emissions, meaning zero use of any hydrocarbons for any purpose, regardless of offsets. This other pathway is degrowth and decarbonization. A sudden and significant drop in our living standard is a requirement to get to zero emissions. This means a radical change in lifestyle, how we travel, how we heat our homes, how we work what we eat, where we live, and how financial institutions and governments keep track of it all. It won't be long before every individual action and decision will be measured based on ESG scores, something very similar to the social credit system operating in China. The goal is to transform the entire global system through a net zero transition and ESG scores. The hydrocarbon production and consumption in the Western developed countries will be terminated first. But what about China and the rest of the world? Despite environmental groups' pronouncements to the contrary, China is not giving up its use of hydrocarbons. In fact, China is building more pipelines to receive oil and natural gas from Russia. It is building more refineries to process more oil from Russia in the Middle East. It adds more coal power capacity every day, 11.4 gigawatts in the first half of 2020 alone during a pandemic and it is expanding its petrochemical industry. China also controls more than 80% of the global rare earth mineral production and refining that is necessary for windmills and solar panels. This is not done using renewables. So while the West commits to keeping their hydrocarbons in the ground, China is expanding their use. While Western countries pursue unreliable renewables, China will make and export the solar panels and windmills to us. While Western private petroleum companies are denied financing due to ESG requirements, Chinese state petroleum companies are not bound by such rules and buy up assets around the world. China did not begin the environmental movement, but it is certainly taking advantage of the self-destructive situation and is encouraging the voluntary decline of Western civilization. For those who pay attention, China has been quite clear that its ambition is to be the dominant global superpower by 2050, which happens to coincide with the climate change net zero targets. In either scenario, net zero or Chinese domination by 2050, both end in some form of totalitarianism. The costs of net zero to our civilization and humanity are too high, and the benefits of hydrocarbons to human flourishing need to be considered. 
Our current system may not be perfect, but it has improved the care of our environment and planet and people unlike any others. This is a system worth restoring and fighting for. Today I'll be speaking with John Robson on China's global ambitions, how it's related to the climate movement and the push for a net zero transition. John is the executive director of the Climate Discussion Nexus, a documentary filmmaker, National Post, Epoch Times and Looney Politics columnist and contributing editor to the Dorchester Review. John is also an adjunct professor at Augustine College. He holds a BA and MA from the University of Toronto and a PhD in American history from the University of Texas, Austin. John has worked in academia, think tanks, and politics, as well as doing print, radio, television, and online journalism in Canada. He produced and hosted the documentary, The Great War Remembered, for Sun News Network in 2014, and crowdfunded the documentary and companion book, Magna Carta, Our Shared Legacy of Liberty, in 2015, and A Right to Arms in 2016, as well as the documentaries True, Strong and Free, Fixing Canada's Constitution in 2016, and The Environment, A True Story in 2017. Thank you for joining me today, John. It's a real pleasure to have this conversation with you on such a, an important issue. Well, it's good to be here. You know, I just wanted to say that I really found your Magna Carta documentary amazing, and I encourage people to check it out along with the companion book. Well, thank you. It's, you know, I think it's especially appropriate at, at this point where there's a lot of uh, self-examination in Canada over our, our treatment of, of Aboriginal people. And a number of uh, municipalities are canceling Canada Day and people are saying, oh, Canada is just, uh, it, it's just bad. It's a genocidal, colonial, settler state with no virtues. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves that there was more liberty under law in Canada and in the rest of the English-speaking world than there ever was or ever was going to be in the rest of the world. And the fact that the circle of freedoms and rights and protections was not always drawn broadly enough doesn't mean that the circle wasn't real and that it wasn't very important to be inside it. And so I, I hope that people will watch the Magna Carta documentary and come to understand that it's our history is not a fraud. Our history is not a horror story. That liberty under law is real and that the institutions that we evolve need to be preserved. Because, again, what we're seeing at this point that the parliament has been treated with open contempt by uh, the incumbent prime minister and cabinet. And there's a lot of indifference on the part of the public. We think every four years we have a plebiscite to see who should be in the la in the Roman sense a dictator, not, you know, like like. Leonid Brezhnev or Xi Jinping, but but someone who has basically unlimited power until the next election. Um, so I hope that people will watch the documentary. It is free on YouTube, thanks to all the people who supported us through crowdfunding, though. You can also buy a copy. It's my worst sales pitch ever. Buy my free documentary, but I do so. <laughs> yeah, well, th you know, thanks for pointing that out, especially, you know, what we're talking about today is the climate change issue in China and everything, but yet part of me thinks that this is a system change that they want. And in order to get the public on side for changing a system, they have to make the the existing system sound terrible. And I think they've done a really good job with that with respect to the, the Aboriginal issues. The fact that you would cancel Canada Day is just absurd. And... and it just, to me, it, it's part of the this process of changing the whole system and getting the people on side to support that agenda. Yeah, I, I think that there's a kind of range of views. I think there are certainly people who, yeah, it is appropriate to throw the watermelon jibe at them, right? They're green on the outside, but red on the inside. And they understand very well that they're proposing a, a drastic change in our way of life that that they would be proposing even if there wasn't an environmental issue. I mean, one thing about following public policy for many years is that you discover that there's a, there's a category of people out there. It's like a comedian who, you know, every joke has the same bad punchline. Whatever they say is the current crisis, their solution is always that we need to surrender more control over our lives to a government guided by a wise elite, of which, gosh, shucks, they happen to be members. 
But I think there are also people who don't understand. They think that we could really move away from fossil fuels and have very little else change. And there's a very funny video that was just put out by uh, the head of Liberty Energy after North Face, the outdoors um, clothing and gear company, refused to make logo jackets for an oil and gas company. And this guy did this great video saying, thank you, North Face, for being such a great customer of the oil and gas industry and pointing out that everything they make just about is made of fossil fuels and made with fossil fuels for people who get out into the outdoors using fossil fuels. And I think this, the people at the North Face didn't, I don't think they understood that the, the plastic in their products came from oil. They, they weren't, you know, plotting to put Xi Jinping in charge of the world. They were just so clueless. They thought there were Gore-Tex Gore trees somewhere. Um, so it's important to bear in mind that the, the, the great danger in life is not c conscious conspiracy. It's misguided sincerity, not because there aren't people out there who are real thinks, right? But there are people who are active agents of the Chinese government working to undermine Western democracy, and they're not all in China. But, but the big problem is how many people are just led to this vision that we'll all go live in the Shire and we'll be prosperous and warm and safe and well-fed. Uh, and our rights will be respected. Uh, we just won't burn that dirty old oil anymore. And they have no idea how much we depend upon oil for everything from uh, our agriculture to our national security. If, if they could see this vision of the world as it would actually turn out, they'd be horrified. But they're, uh, it, it's difficult to get them to understand. People, they go, oh, yeah, solar power, solar is great. Hey, just power from the sun. And they don't understand where the solar panels come from. They don't realize how horrible they are to get rid of once they've uh, they've reached the end of their useful life, like the wind turbines. And the these create enormous quantities of toxic junk. They eat up huge amounts of uh, space. Their, their footprint is enormous. Uh, and they don't deliver reliable energy. Uh, if, if these people were thinking more clearly, they'd be advocating for nuclear power. And, of course, you can get a bit suspicious of some of the people who presumably do realize that nuclear power might let us move away from oil without compromising our prosperity or our freedom and don't want to do it. But again, I, I very much resist conspiracy theories because if you look at human beings in operation, it reminds me of the line from um, one of the Shanghai Nights movies when um, Chun Wen comes up with some elaborate plan and Wyatt Earp says, what in our history together makes you believe I'm capable of something like that? Uh, most <laughs> human beings are struggling so desperately to perform the job they're allowed to be doing that the idea that they might also be pulling off a conspiracy and hiding it is hard to believe. But to bring us back to China and... Uh, the the Chinese plan to become the dominant world power, they're not hiding it. They're quite open about it. Uh, they discuss it in party documents. They don't, don't, don't mention this to the foreigners if you can avoid it. But this wolf warrior diplomacy, I and mean, boy, the kid gloves sure came off and revealed the werewolf's claw in a hurry there. Oh, for sure. And it, it was very interesting to watch that exchange and read the transcript and and just see how sort of contemptuous <laughs> the Chinese were to the the Americans at the table there. Um, so one of the before we get into a full blown discussion about that aspect, I'm wondering if we could just step back a bit and from one historian to another, I'm curious to know how you came to the climate change issue and how the climate discussion nexus came about. Well, we, we met halfway, I think it's fair to say, because uh, as a historian, I have some considerable awareness of the kinds of panics that sweep the Western world involving the need for us dramatically to reform our own way of life before we bring disaster down on our heads. And so when climate change rather suddenly became a thing in the late 1990s and Jean Chrétien declared that we were going to adhere to the Kyoto Protocol and started throwing that ugly word deniers around, which is obviously drawn from Holocaust deniers. It was just a nasty, dirty, low-down, brass-knuckle smear. And so I looked at this and I thought, there's something familiar about this. So then I looked into the claims and realized that the science behind it was very suspicious. Because again, speaking of history, but if you think history takes you back to uh, Magna Carta or the Norman Conquest or even the Battle of Actium, ha, I'm just warming up. Because I got interested in, okay, well, they say that the Earth's climate was basically stable until humans came along and wrecked everything in around, well, they're never quite clear when, 1900, 1950, 1875, you know, 1970. 
But I just I looked at the past history of the Earth's climate. And I said, look, it's always been unstable. The planet has normally been much warmer than it is today. And there is no historical evidence that CO2 drives temperature. So I immediately started looking for people who were saying that man-made global warming was a problem, who had some idea that these were issues that needed to be addressed. And I discovered that they're basically they don't. Uh, that Al Gore, you know, in, in An Inconvenient Truth, which was you know, 10 years down the road from this moment, um, but he said, yeah, climate was basically stable from the last retreat of the glaciers. And there's just, no, you, you haven't heard of the Holocene climate optimum. You haven't heard of the Younger Dryas. You haven't heard of the Little Ice Age. And then, of course, Michael Mann and company tried to get rid of the medieval warm period and a, a historical assassination. And I thought to myself, between the the familiarity of this panic, I've been through a number of these, we're all going to die panics, you know, resource depletion was going to happen, nuclear winter was going to happen. And it was always our fault and we had to repent. There was always this kind of displaced religious impulse, you know, and I, yeah. I don't say that uh, slightingly, but this idea that we are in some way not what we ought to be, that we are all sinners and that we must uh, repent of our sins and we must mend our ways or perdition awaits us has gotten transferred to very secular causes. So it looked a lot like that. And uh, it seemed to me to be a historical. And so then I, I started to write about this and say, well, here, here are some challenges. Here are some things that need to be addressed if you're really going to make this work, including you don't know where the CO2 is coming from and you don't understand the natural CO2 cycle. And, um, and I found that people involved were not willing to take up the challenge. They just very quickly started calling me names, started calling carbon dioxide names, you know, carbon pollution, they call it. Uh, yeah. Perhaps could live without it. Um, and so th this became one of my concerns. Then we started doing the documentaries after Sun News Network collapsed. Uh, and uh, in 2016, I thought, I need to do one on this global warming issue. I need to make it a story. I mean, historians tell stories. That's why it's the environment of true story to say, okay, what is the alarmist claim? You know, because if you don't understand your opponent's case, you don't understand your own. So the documentary starts out with trying to establish my environmental credentials so people will listen. And then it says, let's find, let's investigate this claim, but let's, let's state it fairly. Let's say, what do the alarmists say? And then let's take it analytically. And as a result of this uh, documentary, again, uh, crowdfunded, I thought there's, there's a place to uh, create an, or an organization that will reach out to the informed layperson. And of course, you'll be amused by this, I think. But periodically, somebody will discover that I'm a historian, right? They'll ferret it out, like Sherlock Holmes and the fact that it's in my biography and that we did a video about why a historian looks at climate change. And they'll say, oh, well, he's just a historian. He shouldn't have an opinion on climate change. And, and part of my retort is, what are you, a nuclear physicist? Because a lot of times these people have no scientific training at all. But the, the bigger and more serious point is the voters, for the most part, are not climate scientists. Voters have an enormous range of careers. But that doesn't mean that they're not expected to cast a ballot in an election that turns on questions of budgetary policy, even if they're not accountants, economic policy, even if they're not economists, on foreign policy issues, even if they're not generals or, I don't know, what, what political scientists or something they're meant to be. Um, you know, people are asked to, to vote on a huge range of issues where they don't have formal academic credentials of a postgraduate kind. And then you get this one issue and a bunch of people who probably, you know, failed grade 11 chemistry are saying, oh, you can't talk about this. You're not a climate scientist. I'll tell you what the science says. It's like you have no idea what the science says. Um, but it's the idea that, that the layperson, the voter, can't have an opinion on this and just has to do what they're told. There's an anti-democratic impulse there, not always explicit and not always, I think, understood by the person making the claim. But again, you look at, you know, not only Al Gore, but say Justin Trudeau. He goes rattling on about climate change all the time, blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. Well, he certainly isn't a climate scientist. Why is he allowed to have an opinion? And I'm not. Um, so the climate discussion nexus is for people with any level of scientific training who take an intelligent interest in public affairs, including this one. And we make videos and we put it on a newsletter and we, we try to keep it civil. We, we try to remove any comments that uh, use swear words, for instance. This puzzles people in the modern world, but we don't allow obscenity. We don't allow conspiracy theories. We don't allow ad hominem or ad feminem attacks. We try to engage in a discussion on the facts and the logic because it's an important public policy issue and we need to come to rational decisions about it because if the alarmists are right 
then we got to do something at almost any cost. But if they're wrong, we are running ourselves into a brick wall for nothing. So it, I think it seems to me it should be possible to have a civil discussion on that basis. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And when I think about this absurd idea that the climate was stable till people came along, I mean, everyone, if you talk to people and you ask them, do you, do you agree that there's been an ice age in the past? Yes. Okay, so what happened after the last ice age? What happened during the ice age? Was the climate not different? And was it the same? Once the ice age ended, was it just the same? Did the temperature not not change at all? Was there no fluctuations? And it's just so crazy. And then, like you talked about trying to erase the medieval warming period. I just saw a call for papers where a group of historians are having a whole conference about the medieval warming period. So how come historians recognize that the medieval warming period existed, but yet these climate scientists are trying to say, no, 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 that was never the case. And it's only been recently that that we've been contributing to to the temperature. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a point that I make actually in the documentary because I say if you take any kind of book on almost any subject that isn't directly about climate change, and one of them is a book on architecture, and they talk about the medieval warm period as though it existed without any question. It's only in climate science that anybody tries to say that it doesn't. And by the, just as a side issue, um, when you bring up the question of the ice ages, something that the, the rather more sophisticated alarmists will say is, oh, yes, but that's because of the Milankovitch cycles, these irregularities in the um, orbit and the spin of the Earth. We know this happens, but the, in this, it's a pretty good explanation of a lot of things that happen in the Earth's climate. But the problem is the Milankovitch, during much of the Pleistocene, the, the glaciations and retreats were on a 41,000 year cycle, and then suddenly it went to 100,000 years and nobody knows why. So that is uh, that's kind of an issue. But and then to come back to the medieval warm period, I recently read a book that was published in 2000 by a guy named Brian Fagan, who was not a historian or a climate scientist. He's a I think he's a geologist, but he just he's one of these intelligent generalists who wrote books on a lot of things. And he was but he was all in on climate change. Oh, yeah, man, made global warming is the worst thing ever. But he talks about the little ice age and how it affected history. And he says one of the things the medieval warm period, which he's just doesn't question exists because he, he knows it did. Uh, was was characterized not just by relatively warm conditions, but by mild weather. And then when it starts to cool, the weather turned terrible. And you got hurricanes and you got floods and you got droughts and oh, you got everything just awful. And I thought to myself, if the climate alarmists can't even agree whether warming brings good weather or bad weather, it's very hard to debate with them because they're so slippery. If you get if you get unusually cold weather, it's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's weather. If it gets unusually hot, they say, oh, it's climate change. And when you ask them for a prediction, you know, will there be more hurricanes? And if there are a lot of hurricanes, they say, yeah, there'll be more hurricanes. But if there aren't a lot of hurricanes, there was a 12 year gap with major hurricanes making landfall in the United States. Then they started saying, oh, yes, global warming limits them because of a thing called wind shear. And then as soon as a bad one hits, they're like, yeah, we told you global warming means more hurricanes. So or, or they'll just like Catherine McKenna, Canada's uh, environment ministry for some years, uh, environment minister who said, well, you know, global warming is causing more wildfires. It's just obvious. Disaster's upon us. It's the fifth horseman. But her own department keeps pretty good statistics on wildfires in Canada that shows that they were actually not increasing. So you have the minister saying things that her own department says aren't happening. And again, how do you have a, a, a rational debate with people who... It's not as though like we're making up statistics on wildfire that they question. Her own department is putting out statistics. Uh, or, or the IPCC, you know, people say, oh, you know, the weather's getting worse. And then you look at the IPCC reports and they say, we don't have good evidence that the weather's getting worse. We think maybe it will in the future. But for now, no, it's not. And yet they go blathering on about this. And then if you say, but hang on, the IPCC doesn't say that. They say, well, you're not a climate scientist. They say, well, neither are you, but the IPCC are. Um or, or they'll do this right. thing. I remember yeah. when Will Happer was going to uh, temporarily uh, taken in by the Trump White House. And uh, there was a newspaper writer who said, Happer's not a climate scientist. And Will Happer is an atmospheric physicist, uh, which is like if the, if the physics of the atmosphere isn't relevant to climate change, I don't know what would be. And then I looked up and the two authors, and one of them was a political science major, one of them was an English major or something like that. And Will Happer is a very distinguished atmospheric physicist and an inventor. And they're like, well, what does he know about climate? 
um, which, which again is not it's not real argument. I think it's uh, and, and that's one of the things that to come, circle back to your original question. One of the things that made me very suspicious about this theory from early on was the rapidity with which its adherents went to the ad hominem attacks and the difficulty they had coming to grips with anything resembling a substantive debate. And that is that that's always a warning sign. If people will not discuss the issue with you and start calling you dirty names, um, there is something wrong with the way they're approaching the issue. Especially with the slipperiness, slipperiness that you describe, because it's like it's the same thing with the ideology. So for if you say someone will declare themselves a liberal and then you say, well, isn't that sort of like socialism? No, 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 I'm not a socialist. I'm a progressive. Well, doesn't progressivism sort of hold these things? No, 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 but I'm a liberal. And it's that slipperiness in wanting to say exactly what they mean. And when you can't, when you can't pin that down, how can you possibly have a discussion? And yeah, people say the rich should pay their share. And you say, what is their share? And they won't tell you. Right. And there's no accountability. So like when Catherine McKenna comes out and blatantly contradicts what her own department says, who holds her to account? Right? Yeah, people it, it, people and, and, hear and, it and, and they're, they're like, oh, okay, well, she said it. And then someone else who doesn't have as big a platform comes back and says, well, no, 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 that's not right. She's contradicting her own department. Well, they, they don't get the same coverage. It's not the same. So there's no accountability there, it seems. Well, and it does seem as though at least some media outlets have a policy of not having giving any air to cl- or print to climate deniers. There's it, really radio stations in Ottawa that I used to appear on that now, you know, I just never hear from them. Um, but, the, you know, the climate discussion nexus is one of the ways the Internet makes it harder to pull off that kind of thing. We uh, we have had nearly five million total views on our videos. And that is uh, that's an extremely gratifying sign that there are people out there who are not willing to be bullied. And not all of them are necessarily entirely skeptical about climate change and you know, deniers who say humans have no impact. We're a, we're we, we're not a dogmatic outfit with a catechism. But the funny thing is that this this I'm going to call it bullying attitude by the politicians and by some media outlets and so on, although it does in some ways tend to steamroll opposition. Also, it has an off putting effect. People don't like being told what to think. You know, there's there's still a kind of spark of independence. I mean, look, in, in, in the UK, right, what everybody said, you can't vote for Brexit. People went out and voted for Brexit. And I think some of them did it just because they looked at the lineup of people telling them not to and thought, if all those people are in agreement on something, it's got to be wrong. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, the, the, the truth is that is the tortoise and, and the panic is the hare and the hare gets out of there in a hurry. But then it, it wanders around being kind of harebrained and the truth just plods on. Um, and what, one of the things that, I, again, to be a bit discouraging, I have a feeling that in five or 10 years, this whole climate panic will be forgotten because it'll turn out that the world is not continuing to heat. I mean, if it does, right, if, if, if what happened recently out in Oregon and now in Western Canada, if that becomes the norm, then obviously I'm wrong. And, you know, for whatever reason, the planet's heating up, though, it, again, it might not be human beings. But um, if the hiatus continues and we are actually in quite a long one, then people will like Bill Murray and Caddyshack, they'll tiptoe away and, and just deny they were ever there and that most of them will get away with it. That That is the depressing thing. The number of uh, ways in which people could be consistently wrong on major public policy issues and panic and say we must surrender our freedom, uh, our our existing system is no good, It's we it's got to go. And then when it turns out that they were making it all up, um, then they'll go off and find some other cause and say the same thing again. They say we've got to give up our freedom, we need bigger government, we need a rule by the elites, I'm in the elite, thank you very much, I'll make six figures doing it. Um, but, but you know, the, the climate change debate will be settled ultimately by what happens outside the window. If, you know, if Ottawa turns into conditions that one associates typically with New Delhi, then you say, yeah, the world sure did get hotter. And if it doesn't, you know, if it continues to snow in late April and we have cool spells through the summer and stuff like that, they'll, they'll have to go find a new panic. And I'm sure they'll manage it. Oh, for sure. Because there, there seems to be a lot of... Um... A lot of money to be made and attention to be gotten with the with the idea of panic, particularly in the media, you know, where every every scare story, every negative story is what gets gets really highlighted in the news. And so 
So I wonder sometimes if the media prefers bad news to report that there's there's a little more to it than that, that that humanity has this predilection um, towards the negative and, you know, the the sort of I need to be more prepared for the bad things that are happening. So I, I'm more on the alert for that kind of thing. And, and that that attitude and that sort of um, organic response within humanity is is being exploited in order to push this whole climate emergency issue. Well, yeah, before the internet destroyed media, I used to be invited periodically to talk about media bias. And one point that I made is that, you know, the Paleolithic Times, the headline, Sabertooth Tiger Outside Village, belonged on page one, because you'd had to know this. But no Sabertooth Tiger Outside Village was buried on page A8, because it wasn't going to get you killed if you didn't know it. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, the press rightly focuses on the unusual and the alarming. The problem is when they are mistaken about what it is, this idea that we never used to have weather. Um, and again, when, when you look at, if you read the, the, that, that book, The Little Ice Age, or you look at the Der Grote Mandrank, this horrendous flooding that came at the end of the medieval warm period and, and washed away entire towns and stuff. Um, the idea that bad weather is a recent invention is just absurd. And in fact, if, if you take your thumb off the scale, American government agencies are complicit in this one. If you look at the unadjusted temperature data, that is what the thermometer actually said, the 1930s were the hottest decade since the end of the Little Ice Age, not the 2010s, at least in the United States. Elsewhere, we just don't have good measurements and people make stuff up, right? They, well, people tell you what's the hottest year ever. It's like, how on earth do you think anybody knows what the weather was like in Zambia in 1910? Exactly. Uh, it's just it's exactly. ridiculous. Or, or in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, nobody has any idea. We're not even that sure what it's like there now. You know, those satellites, some people think the satellites are taking, you know, a thousand measurements a day in every square meter of the, of the surface of the ocean. I assure you, they are doing nothing of the sort. Um, and, no, they don't work that, work that reliable. And... <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying that the satellites just don't work that way. <laughs> I know. In fact, some because somebody said if you don't believe the satellites are uh, are doing that, you know, look on Google Earth at your own backyard. And so I looked on Google Earth, and there was a picture of my backyard that was five years old. <laughs> but 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 again, this is the classic. You're not a climate scientist. Here's somebody who was just thundering at me in the comments on the climate discussion nexus. No, you're an idiot. You don't know this. And you don't know that. But they haven't actually examined the question. They haven't looked at how the satellites work. They have looked in the catechism, and it says warming is real. Everybody knows that there's a 97% scientific consensus. There are satellites up in space. Or that thing will be say, well, the, the Arctic ice, you know, it, it's, it's at its lowest since satellite records began. Well, yeah, because satellite records began in 1979 at the end of a cooling trend that, again, the alarmists have a lot of trouble explaining. It got cooler from about 1940 to 1970. So starting at a time when you know the Arctic ice was at a higher level than it had been through most of the 20th century and saying, see, it went down, man did it. Well, how do you explain what it was like in 1900 then? And of course, again, they can get slippery. Uh, Brian Fagan's book, he says, oh, well, you see, the settlement of the Canadian prairies in the American West and of Australia, there was a lot of forest clearance. There's a huge release of carbon dioxide in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and that started the warming. But if you go to somebody like Michael Mann and you say, have human beings been significantly warming the earth since before the First World War, he'll almost certainly tell you no. And then you say, well, who are we meant to be arguing with here? Could somebody tell me when the natural warming gave way to the man-made warming? And then we can discuss the reasons why we think that. Because again, if you look at the pattern of warming in the 20th century, the ups and downs, ups and downs, if you were, hadn't been told there's a theory that humans caused it, you wouldn't look at it and say, oh yeah, it was natural till here, but then something different happens. Now, okay, if the temperature shoots up to 50 degrees centigrade, then that will be different. Um, but, but based on the actual historical data, there is nothing to suggest that what's happening now is not part of this natural cycle, right? Roman warm period, dark ages, cool period, medieval warm period, Little Ice Age, and then a warming that starts in Victorian times and has continued, but erratically as climate and weather tend to be, uh, up until the late 20th century. And then there's the business about the sun, right? The sun was very active in the late 20th century, and there are strong reasons for thinking that increased solar activity uh, correlates with increased temperature. Everything from some very good historical matching of some of the proxies 
to the idea. It's not it's not the direct heat of the sun that doesn't fluctuate all that much. But when the solar wind gets stronger, uh, it tends to shield the Earth from cosmic rays and cosmic rays tend to seed clouds um, that reflect heat. Uh, and so when more cosmic rays get in the planet, it's cooler and when fewer get in the planet it's warmer. Um, so there are all kinds of things here that need to be debated and discussed. Instead of people just saying, shut up, you dirty denier. Oh, and one more thing, because you, you talk about the panic. One of the things that galls me, people say the deniers have all the money. If I, if I had a dollar for every person who accused me of getting money from the Koch brothers, I would, I would be so rich I wouldn't need it. But then you look at the government grants that go to the alarmists, and you look at the, Al Gore's mansion. The money's on the side of the alarmists. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It's not really relevant to the case. But the gall of suggesting that we're the ones who are in it for the money, when they have have most of the money is another example of, of dirty arguing. Right. And because they're trying to claim the moral high ground, because whatever they're doing is for the greater good of the planet and planet Earth is at stake. And so if they happen to be making some money at it, oh, well, because it's, you know, this great moral cause. And by, you know, characterizing opponents as being deniers like the Holocaust, that of course has a, a connotation to it, which is basic, so dismissive. And also it puts you lower on the ethical and moral level. So by making it a moral case, they, they've taken away the ability to have a decent discussion because heck, you're like Hitler. You can't have a debate with Hitler, right? Yeah, exactly. Who wants to do that? And, you know, here it's interesting. Thomas Sowell wrote a very a book that influenced me enormously when I was in grad school called The Conflict of Visions, where he talked about the, the thing that George Will put into an aphorism, that if you disagree with a conservative, they'll call you stupid. And if you disagree with a liberal, they'll call you mean spirited or words to that effect. And so we'll talk a lot about this, this very deep divide between people who, who are focused on what methods work. And on practical competence and the lessons of history versus people who are focused on good intentions and the bright future that awaits us if only we had enough love in our hearts. And so part of it, it's very natural for some people, if you disagree with them, to assume that you are actually deliberately trying to make something bad happen. And I remember we were back in the Cold War seeing these battling bumper stickers that I thought captured this instinct very well. Those of us who favored rearmament and a firm posture in the face of Soviet aggression would have peace through strength, which is a method. And then the people on the other side would have visualized world peace, which is about intentions. And it's hard to talk across that divide. But I think part of the thing is for conservatives not to just call people stupid, because as Dale Carnegie said, if you start out, you're an idiot because you never persuade anybody. And for liberals to resist the urge to give us a scolding for our moral failings, and instead to try to say, what is the issue in front of us? What are the facts that we each think are decisive in deciding that issue? Why do we think these facts are the most important ones? Are these facts reliable? And are we treating them in a logical manner? And if we could try and have that sort of discussion and say, well, let's look at the temperature record. For instance, um, recently, a, a guy named Wei Zhang looked at uh, NASA's adjustment of temperature because NASA takes the raw temperature and they adjust it. And yeah. he said... Yeah. If I'm looking for causal factors, we did a regression analysis, how much they adjust the temperature versus how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. And he found a very strong fit. So basically, because NASA knows that CO2 causes warming, they take the temperature data and adjust it so that more CO2 means higher temperatures. But this is Pinidio uh, Principi, right? This is assuming what you set out to prove. And if you don't do that, if you stop adjusting the temperature based on your conception that CO2 must be making it warmer, and look at the actual temperature or if you if you discard the readings from cities because we know there's an urban heat island effect and a lot of uh temperature stations that used to be out in a field are now on an airport runway which of course is a ridiculous way to measure temperature so if you just look at those uh temperature stations that are still in rural areas you find that the warming trend in the united states since uh, over the 20th century basically disappears and this is the sort of thing we ought to be debating, saying, well, is there some reason why that's not conclusive? Is there some reason why the rural stations aren't reliable? Is there some uh, care being taken in the urban stations to correct for the tendency of asphalt to trap heat? And, and to give you a, a, a personal anecdote about this, we actually have a cottage outside Ottawa. And when I come back from the cottage, one of the things that I noticed, because now, of course, my car measures the temperature, because where would we be if our cars didn't do that? Um, invariably, the temperature goes up by a couple of degrees as I come into Ottawa. 
And Ottawa is not even like a city like Los Angeles, but but there's a real tendency of cities to trap heat. And there's some question, too, of whether um, patterns in agriculture don't also um, tend to uh, intensify heat in hot areas and, and cooling in cool areas. But all of this is stuff that needs exploring and civil discussion. And that is something that is at such a premium these days. And again, that's why I say at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we try to keep rudeness out from our side as well as their side. Uh, well, because it just well, is so unconstructive. Th there's two things I want to comment on. Number one, I loved how you guys did the 1919 or 2019 temperature comparisons. Those, those were so fun. I'd put it in front of my kids and I'd say, okay, which, one, which year do you think this is? And, and it was always really fun to try and figure it out. And then the second issue is um, is how you said you had like a million, oh, five million views. And I know that you've had over a million views on the 97% um, of the scientists consensus video. And I thought that was such a great video explaining the issue um, on whether or not how, how they came up with that number in the first place, how you could possibly have consensus in science and and what that meant for for the whole climate change issue. And I was so glad to see that it that a lot of people have have viewed that video. Yeah, that's extremely gratifying because, of course, that what 97 percent of scientists agree isn't a conversation starter. It's a conversation stopper. It's a claim yeah. that you must be an idiot if you don't accept this. And it doesn't even matter if I can explain it or not, because all the scientists agree. And yet the funny thing is that this claim is almost exclusively put forward by non-scientists. Uh, it was it started with Barack Obama tweeting about it. And well, you know, you, whatever you think of Barack Obama, it is very difficult to make the case that he's a trained climate scientist. So why does he have an opinion? How did he know? And then, you, I mean, if you know anything about surveys and statistical procedures, you think, wait a minute, 97 percent of, of scientists um well, who surveyed them? How many scientists are there in the world? How would you reach them all? What was the response rate? So we, we actually looked at the methodology of the various studies involved. And But again, if you look at this claim in public debate, some people, John Kerry, when he was Secretary of State, said 97% of the world's scientists. And I thought to myself, well, you mean like including the people who study worms? Like, <laughs> other terms of more modest climate scientists, but the, the, tr the fact is that, you know, these surveys did things like they asked one of the, of the most important ones asked people, is it warmer now than it was in 1870? And do you think humans have had some effect? And yeah, of course, you got a very strong response saying, yes, it's warmer than it was in Victorian times. The Little Ice Age was real and it ended. And yeah, we think that uh, human production of CO2 has had some effect or even something else humans did. But then Barack Obama says 97% of scientists agree it's uh, urgent, man-made and dangerous. And of course, the survey didn't ask them if warming was man-made. It didn't ask if it was dangerous. And so he was, I mean, I'm not going to say he was lying. I think he was just confused. He saw what he expected to see instead of what was really there. And, you know, or Naomi Oreskes study where she read some abstracts and, and, and she, uh, she claimed that 97% of them endorsed it, but she, she eventually dialed that back some distance because people started pointing out that they, they went and read them too. But it was, you know, she picked 900 papers out of thousands um, and some of them just said, you know, they were talking about climate change in the distant past. It was, it was incredibly sloppy. And then Al Gore turned this into nobody disagreed in, in an inconvenient truth. He takes that study and he just twists it so hard it screams in the background. Uh, but, but the point is that this is a claim about science that is based on really, really like fail high school math statistical methodology. So it, it but it's important because it's, you have to get past that to have a discussion. And that's why, yeah, of our nearly 5 million views, over a fifth of them, that video alone, because it's the, it opens the door to debating the issue. And that's the kind of thing that we're determined to do, just to say, if we're going to have a discussion here, let's have an informed discussion. Let's know what we're talking about. And let's not have people who have no idea where the 97% number came from wheeling it like a medieval mace with those nasty spiky points on it, just crushing everybody in their path. Because that's not how science advances. The same people who, who tell the Galileo story, it's horrible The church silence Galileo. Well, I have a question about the sun and climate change. Shut up, you heretic. It's, your, your, your performance <laughs> is self-parody. Yes, for sure. And, you know, when you were talking about the the litany of um, end of the world type 
climate alarmist claims and so on. I came across a website called extinctionclock.org. I don't know if you've seen it, but they list like all of the all the different extinction predictions, um, end of the world kind of climate predictions. I think they start in 1956 with the peak oil and so on. And then like in 1970, for example, the experts believed between 75 and 80 percent of living animals will be extinct in 25 years. And so on their little list, they have the claim the year it was made um, and whether or not it's it actually came true. And so they have a list of a bunch of, the, of new claims that have been made probably over the past five or 10 years. And and the the time bar for the future keeps getting moved, right? Because they make these claims, they don't happen. So then the 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 controversy sort of dies out a bit, kind of like the Club of Rome and their and their terrible report on limits to growth and how that was dismissed for a while. And then they just kind of went quiet and then woof, it's back again. And it's the same claims, the exact same claims that were made in that book. They're making them again, except this time now it's 2050. Or it's 2100 or something. Yeah. So sometimes they put it so far off that you can't test it, but say we can't wait until we find out if it's true. You must do what I say right now. Uh, other times they, uh, they'll they change the reason why we're all going to die, but keep the same deadline. Or yeah, or they'll shift it like the disappearing Arctic ice where they'll push it back by three or four years every time. Or even the, the, the classic one, we have 10 years to stop climate change. And it just it's always 10 years. The, uh, yeah. To his credit, at one point, Prince Charles said it was 10 years. And then he started counting down. Okay, well, now we've got nine years and seven months. Now we've got eight years and eight months. But then... Because ten years is a good time, right? Because it's it's not so immediate that you just say, "Oh, it's hopeless," but it's not so distant that you don't worry. Uh, but of course, uh, at some point, it becomes comic. It's like Barack Obama. Whenever he visited some American ally, he would say, "This country punches above its weight." And someone put together a film clip of him saying this in about fifteen different countries. And at some <laughs> point, if every time you stand up, you say, "We've got ten years to save the planet," people are going to put together a, a, a you know collage of your greatest hits, and it's going to look a bit silly. But again, the fact that there are people who obviously believe that we're about to destroy the planet, um, it doesn't mean that they're wrong this time, but it also doesn't mean that they're right. Just because they said it doesn't mean it's true. And Paul Ehrlich, you know, it's too late to prevent hundreds of millions of people from starving to death. And in fact, the world population soared. And one of the reasons why we didn't see mass starvation is that the increase in CO2 has led to a greening. It has led to better plant growth in places where it's hard to grow plants, which is often a place where pe poor, hungry people live. So this has been an enormous benefit. But at the same time, I'm not saying so human CO2 is this great thing because it's very possible, and the historical record uh, strongly supports this, that warming causes CO atmospheric CO2, not the other way around. As the oceans warm, they degas. And Al Gore did that thing where he showed, you know, over 800,000 years, this very close match and went, ha ha, gotcha. But if he'd looked a little more closely, he got out of his magnifying glass, he'd have seen that temperature was moving first and CO2 was following. So it's entirely possible that we have more CO2 in the atmosphere now um, because the planet is warmed, not the other way around. And as somebody recently pointed out, well, we did the COVID lockdown and, and there was less human CO2 released, but there was no change in the pattern of atmospheric CO2 accumulation, not even the seasonal variations. And yeah. then the person yeah. went on to say, and this really struck me, if we didn't keep track of how much fossil fuel we burn because it's such a vital part of our economies, if all we had to go was the atmospheric record, we couldn't calculate how much fossil fuel we're burning because it's not making a visible impact on the ecosystem. And that is a hugely revealing fact. If all you had was those famous Mount Aloha readings of CO2, you couldn't use them to figure out how much oil and coal and stuff were burning, which suggests that the direct impact on the climate that people think like Greta Thunberg, who can see CO2. Well, I'll tell you what, she's seeing something else um, because we can't. We can't look at those atmospheric concentrations and go, ah, humans were in lockdown or ah, they got out of lockdown. It's just not, the, the footprint's just not there. That's a really good point. And, and I'm glad you brought that up. And because it's so often people just have this idea that somehow whatever humans are contributing for carbon dioxide, it's separate from the natural occurrence, not that it mixes in and that nobody even knows. Like if you ask a, some Joe on the street, how long does CO2 last in the atmosphere? They probably couldn't give you an answer. 
And, you know, there's this impression that, oh, it must last there forever. And that's why we have to do something. Not that, you know, it's this dynamic system where things are circulating around and, you know, not all of our atmosphere stays on Earth. You know, it does go into space a bit. And it's just interesting that, that this is how the narrative goes forward and people don't really know. And I'm grateful for your for your website and that offers an explanation and some facts that people can look at and try to come to an understanding, even if you're not allowed to necessarily have this debate in public. Yeah, and in fact, you, because you brought up my second least favorite number in the climate debate, my least favorite being the 97% consensus. But my second least favorite is this one that is widely out there that the na natural carbon cycle absorbs all the natural carbon, but half of human stuff stays in the atmosphere. Why? First of all, why would it be half, right? Why, why wouldn't it be a third or something? But also, how does Mother Nature tell the difference? It's like, you know, natural CO2 is fragrant and floral, and our CO2 is, smells like a skunk or something. You know, it tastes bad. It's like the processed cheese of CO2. Of course, this is not true. The, the carbon cycle, if you're looking at a pattern where, say, 97% of all the carbon flux is absorbed and 3% accumulates in the atmosphere, then it's, you know, 97% of the natural is absorbed and 97% of the human is absorbed and 3% of both stays in the atmosphere. And if you look at it that way, if you see an increase in atmospheric CO2 and you think, well, 96% uh, of that is natural, then your attitude to the whole process is vastly different. But I'm telling you, in greenhouses, they pump in CO2, okay? Man-made yeah. CO2. Yeah. And the plants don't go, uh, and wilt. The plants go, ah, and they grow. And, uh, so it's just preposterous, but it, be it became a cliche and it became an unexamined. Prince Charles even said it. I mean, I, I actually kind of like Prince Charles on a lot of things. I share his views on architecture, but boy, on climate. Uh, am I allowed to say, sir, you're not a climate scientist? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but but boy, he, he has certainly uh, peddled some cliches with his habitual grace and charm, but it doesn't make them true. And this thing about, yeah, half of human CO2, and you look at all those little colorful charts people do of here's the cement, you know, and here's the fossil fuels, and here's the ocean absorption. The funny is the numbers often differ quite dramatically despite the science being settled, but they all have this thing about all the natural stuff is cool and it's happy and plants like it, but half of the human stuff just sits there stinking the place out. <laughs> That's a really good description. I love that. Um, so one of the things that that I want to get to is the idea of this climate emergency, because they claim there's a climate emergency, which therefore is the justification to take this really drastic action with net zero. And my concern is like that the policies they're proposing will actually precipitate a crisis, a real crisis, whether it's in energy, like what happened in, in Texas with the, with the difficulties with their renewables and whatnot, um, or whether it's in agriculture because of land use changes, like what they're doing in Europe with the EU Green Deal, or the regulations that um, that that reduce agricultural production or energy production, and whatnot, then things will start to suffer. We'll be less able to adapt to real um, weather events, and then it will all be blamed on climate change. Yeah, it, it's incredible. So there's a zinc oxide, a new kind of thing here. If you really were to eliminate all the fossil fuels from the life of an activist, you know, first their cell phone would disappear and they'd be on their knees weeping already. Um, but but yeah, you, you couldn't cool your house in the in the summer. You couldn't heat it in the winter. You know, the, the world is it's a over 80 percent of energy use is fossil fuels. And if you got rid of that, you'd have 80 percent less energy. And that would just, you know, with, with the obvious implications. And, and I don't care how whether you like the sight of those wind turbines or hate them, and I personally hate them, um, they're not going to fill the gap. And Willis Eschenbach did some calculations if, if Biden was going to keep his pledge to, by 2050 of, of the, the fact the United States would have to com commission, design and build a nuclear reactor. It was a, a, a big nuclear reactor every two weeks or something like that. Um, so the scale of the challenge is impossible. And unfortunately, these people are not engineers any more than they're climate scientists. And most of them just don't begin to understand the difficulty of getting there. And again, if you look at China well, <laughs> and all their coal plants, it's pretty clear that they understand what, what the consequences of getting rid of this stuff would be. And they want us to do it and they don't want to. Um, 
But people just and, and now because they've they've cornered themselves because they said we've got to get the way down by 2030 and we've got to get to net zero by 2050. And then they suddenly go, holy cow, it's 2021. How did that happen? I thought it was like 1983 here. Wasn't I just a young person? And so they're suddenly having to try and do it. And they do things like in Britain where they said, well, you're going to have to get rid of your gas boiler and you're all going to have to get heat pumps. And people went, where am I going to get the money for that? And they're, well, uh, 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 maybe you could get a dual use pump or, or you got to get rid of gasoline cars. I don't remember when they made that pledge. I think it was around 2010 they were going to get rid of gasoline cars. But suddenly it's the, the deadline is looming and people are saying, are you have you gone bizarre? You can't get rid of my car. So the, the real costs are starting to become apparent. And so, you know, we're going to get to shut down the pipelines and badly damage the energy infrastructure and have crises like the one in Texas or California is going to have this summer and unable to uh, provide the air conditioning. But it takes some doing to create an energy shortage in Texas. This is not an easy thing. It's also not there's no way to make it sound like an achievement. But um, but but the real meaning of net zero um it's like people who wanted us to disarm and just leave Russia with all their, or the Soviet Union with all their nuclear weapons. Like, do you have any idea how quickly Leonid Brezhnev would start taking over countries if you did that? Um, so, but now, now it's the, it's become a practical reality, and these people are going to look very silly because if they really had intended to do this, when Jean Chrétien said, you know, we're, we're going to adhere to Kyoto back in 1997, like way back when, um, then they'd have started building nuclear plants. New nuclear plants are safer, they're, you know, modular, there's a hugely improved technology. But instead, most people are like, ah, nuclear power, man, it's like a nuclear bomb, oh, we're all going to die of cancer. Or some utterly inane reaction, or what about the nuclear waste, as though it was generating this stuff like a paint factory pumps out uh, byproducts, as opposed to being very small and easy to handle. So they're not thinking practically about it, and it's now catching up with us, and this is very difficult for them. Because they're, they're insisting that there's this emergency when, again, people are looking out the window most of the time and saying, well, you know, it, it just looks like it always looked here. I mean, in Ottawa today, what's it going to be 26 degrees? Where's the emergency? It's, it's June 30th. Um, and as you pointed out, and thank you for the plug, that 1919 or 2019, we took Canadian government weather statistics, including temperature and other things, and we did overlay charts from a century ago and last year and asked people to tell us which one was the climate emergency. And of course, you couldn't because the lines just all look the same practically. Um, so so they don't have their emergency, but they the one they're going to cause, it's now becoming apparent that they're going to cause one if they really try and do this even halfway. And they're trapped because they can't. How can they say, oh, sorry, we were wrong. It's not necessary. Or, yeah, we're burning up the planet, but we're not going to do anything. They boxed themselves in. I agree that they box themselves in, but I think that there's this, there's a, a stream within the movement that very much wants to see the Western lifestyle diminished and the net zero is part of it. And it's the second pathway I was talking about where they talk about deep decarbonization and, um, you know, you know, to the, the sort of whole climate lockdown idea the eco dictatorship idea especially in the eu where they're 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 still going full steam ahead with these with these ludicrous ideas even though germany with their with their big push for renewables has has suffered tremendously with high um energy prices and and the of all places germany with energy poverty like I, when we lived there people would um, not heat parts of their homes because they couldn't afford it. So what you only heated the room you were in and it was actually still really cold anyway um, because the cost was just too high. And so here we have a major industrialized country whose people, for all intents and purposes, um, the general public, were experiencing a form of energy poverty. And then I read articles and op-eds of people and academics and whatnot saying, oh, well, we're just going to have to get used to intermittent electricity, you know, like Zimbabwe. So we're just going to have to get used to the idea that you're only going to have power between two and four in the afternoon. And maybe you can't use your your electric car because it'll have to, you have to wait to charge it or something. Or, you know, you shouldn't have an electric car anyway. You should be walking and cycling and maybe ride sharing and all these other things. So... <laughs> There, there's the there's a, a stream that wants a more radical change in our civilization, and then the politicians are left trying to sell it. And I don't know how many politicians actually believe it, or or 
they're just kind of presented with this information. Are they true believers? I don't know. But as you say in your in your document or your um background or on China, net zero hasn't been debated or discussed in public. It just kind of appeared one day and became the policy of the UK, now the United States, the EU, Canada. I mean, what what do you think accounts for that? Well, first of all, one of my rules about public affairs as, in fact, with private life is that if people are talking like fools, it's probably because they're thinking like fools. Uh, you want to know what politicians think. I'm afraid what comes out of their mouths is a, is a horrifyingly accurate depiction of what's going on inside their skulls. Um, and it's harder for Europeans to push back because they never had a Magna Carta. And I mentioned this as a sideline. I used to listen to these old time radio shows, some of which still had the original ads embedded in them. And I think these were from America in the 1930s, Blue Coal, which was the best coal. And one of the selling points of blue coal was you won't have to close off some rooms in your house during the winter. Uh, and so, yeah, we've we've taken 80 years to get back to Great Depression conditions in the United States and uh, Germany, one of the world's advanced economies. But the thing is that the, the public also were told, if you look at the, the chirpiness of either the Joe Biden or the Catherine McKenna or, you know, Justin Trudeau, these kind of people, oh, no, the Green New Deal will create jobs. We'll have a new and better prosperity. Everything will be gleaming and shiny and like the Jetsons. And when you start to hear these professors saying, you know what, put on a hair shirt and smile, you're going to walk, you're probably overweight anyway. This is not what the public was promised, and they're not going to like it. I don't think they're going to put up with it. I mean, Angela Merkel is now buying natural gas from Russia because Germans are desperate for affordable energy. What an embarrassing and, and geopolitically feeble come down for her. Yeah, but for I, sure. I think yeah, this is the, thing. the politicians can't push that agenda through on us. Even in Canada where, you know, Magna Carta is but a memory or in, in Britain was it Dave Prime Minister David Cameron was asked what Magna Carta meant and he couldn't uh he couldn't <laughs> translate it, which was pretty uh pathetic performance from a guy with the best education the UK can offer. Um, but but no, the public are not going to put up with living in a cave and eating moss. This is just not going to happen. And again, because the Green New Deal was sold, if you look at, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, if you ask her, well, does this mean we're going to be poorer? No, we're going to be richer. Well, if it turns out that that's not true, there will be a major price to pay politically. And so at some point, again, the tortoise of truth is going to catch up with a hair of, of, of panic. People are going to say, and, and I have this argument even with people in the Canadian oil industry who say, well, we're going to, you know, we're not going to fight on the science because then we'll be called deniers. We're going to fight on the policy. I call this, uh, it's apart from Spike Milligan and the Goon Show, rallying around the white flag. It doesn't work. It, at some point, we're going to have to debate the science. Because if, if 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 the world is really going to catch fire if we keep producing CO two, we don't just have to stop producing it. We got to you know go to war with China to make them stop producing it. And there's the, the consequences are ghastly beyond imagining. But so the alarmist scenarios. You know, James Hansen saying the atmosphere, the oceans will boil and end up in the atmosphere. Well, no price is too high to pay to prevent that if it really might happen. But if the whole thing is nonsense. Um, and, and when people realize the cost they're going to have to pay if they act as though they believed it, there will be more openness to considering that the science behind climate change is very badly flawed. And that's why, that to me is the soft landing happy scenario. And I think and I hope that it's starting to happen because we really do. We are starting to have our backs to the wall. So I, I'd like to add two points there. One, Mark Morano made a really good point in his book, Green Fraud, where he said that when you can seed the premise of climate change and the science and that there's a climate emergency by conceding that point to not question the science by not con by conceding the point that maybe climate is a problem then all you're arguing about is the policy options being too expensive and the way i was thinking of it is like it's like trying to reach a compromise with uh with your executioner and the executioner is offering you a firing squad but you negotiate for a lethal injection instead that you'll administer yourself. I mean, it's not just weak, it's self-destructive. So I think he was really accurate by, because like you said, too many people in the industry are like, oh, I don't want to go there and be faced with these irrational people labeling me a denier. I'm just going to concede that science. And we saw how that worked out for Alberta and Saskatchewan in their court case by not even yeah, arguing the science. It, it's amazing. It's it's such a bad plan that if I was advising you on PR, you'd have a better one. And that's, you know, 
<laughs> That's a pretty serious situation. Uh, and, and But also what's amazing to me about it is that it fails over and over again. And yet whenever you say, you know what, that plan never works, you kind of get this pat on the head and you're told, John, you know, that's all fine in theory, but, you know, we are we are men and women of the world. We are sophisticates. And so I've had this argument with Canadian conservative political parties for more years than I care to remember now, where they say the way for us to win is to pretend to be liberals. And I say, if you tell people liberals are right, they'll vote liberal. And they're like, oh, John, you don't understand practical politics. And they lose an election. And I say, I did tell you about this. They said, oh, no, we were too right wing. We're going to be more left wing. And so now, of course, Aaron O'Toole, who's head of the uh, currently head of the Canadian Federal Conservative Party, you know, and he's all in on climate change and he's woke on gender and he's this and he's that. Every once in a while, he says, I'm the real conservative. You say, and what why is are you conservative, sir? He's like, oh, don't ask me that. Um, and he's going to get crushed in the next election. Because he basically said, I agree with Justin Trudeau, but he's just a more appealing human being than I am, so you should vote for me. And people are like, no, I don't think that that makes any sense. As somebody's going to have to set up, and when they do, even I mean, the, the Donald Trump phenomenon, and I am no fan of Donald Trump, he's a loathsome human being and a wildly unsystematic thinker. But uh, when Donald Trump stood up and just went, Raw, I'm fed up with the way things are going, people voted for him. You know, and, and in, in the Canadian context, federally, if somebody runs for the Conservative Party on a right wing platform, they tend to win. Then they govern from the left and they lose. And then they think to themselves, oh, you know, we shouldn't have run from the right. So they run from the left for three or four elections, and lose them all. Then they run from the right again. They win an election and they govern from the left and they lose. And this pattern has been going on since the First World War. And these people are just impervious to experience, apparently. And so the same thing is true on climate. You know, Aaron O'Toole says, yeah, you know what? We're destroying the planet. But gee, I think it's just uh, I'm too cheap to save it. And then people think you're a fool. You're just an absolute yeah. fool. You, you just said we should destroy the planet to save a few bucks. Like what? And, you know, but they've got all the high priced political consultants. And I'm just a guy running a website. <laughs> well, sometimes the political consultants, I think, are too busy in their little bubble and they don't see what's actually going on amongst the public. Um, the other issue I wanted to just quickly mention was we, we're talking about the political side of things. And there's only so much, I think, that that politicians can do because ultimately they have to win at the at the ballot box. And so that's why I think it's been crucial. And what the what's been happening i'd say since the the first the financial crisis of 2008 2009 is to get finance on side so that now we've got mark carney advocating for net zero and pushing the the esg scores or the tcfd ones or whichever metric they're going to eventually decide on in september before cop 26 but so with finance on side, they can now nudge people. They can force people to do it. Otherwise, you don't get money. You don't get financing. You don't get a mortgage. You're probably not going to get a, a car loan. And then all of these metrics then get taken into account for your everyday life, which then brings us to how how do they, they plan on implementing net zero? Well, they're going to have to establish maybe, as Mark Carney said, these carbon councils. So instead of having politicians who will be stuck, you know, worrying about the next election, they'll have these appointed expert advisory panels, these these carbon councils or some other expert council who will set the targets and monitor them so that it's at arm's length from government. And so to me, this is an awful lot like the Chinese social credit system and that how we're doing net zero, even though the environmental movement wasn't um, founded by China. China is certainly taking advantage of it. And the net zero and the ESG scores and all of that also combines and makes us more like China, which must make China very happy. Yeah, there is an ominous convergence here, isn't there? And it, 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 apparently, it's funny to see that the progressives now wanting the gnomes of Zurich dictating public policy, right? When is the last time progressives thought bankers should bypass the political system in order to force their preferences on the public? And suddenly, I this, know, I know. But you look at a firm like BlackRock, it's the largest asset management company in the world, right? And BlackRock is all in on on climate change and the, the green financing and ESG and so on. But it's also sees its future in China, so it's making much money in China and there it's not pushing that agenda. On the contrary, it's entwined with the Chinese state. And yeah, there's this spectacle of politicians and the uh, commanding heights of industry in cahoots 
to limit the choices available to the populace. Uh, this is, uh, one does see a kind of convergence that one significant difference is in the West, it means no fossil fuels, and in China, it means more fossil fuels. And this is where it is time that people really open their eyes to the fact that net zero by 2050 and the Chinese plan to be the dominant world power by 2049 and start imposing their ideas and their will on the world by 2050 dovetail. Whether or not anybody planned this, and again, within the Chinese Politburo, I'm sure there are people who are actively planning it. In the West, I believe it's far more a matter of useful idiots, not that there aren't Chinese agents of influence, but they're, they're not what's causing this. But these parallel tracks converge in a world where the West is energy poor and poor in other ways and is also militarily weak. And China is energy rich and militarily strong. And Xi Jinping thought is made compulsory in our universities. And unless you are a very creepy person, you don't want that to happen. So we have to ask ourselves at the very least, I quoted recently quoted Vladimir Bukovsky, who wrote an irritated piece in 1984, calling Western liberals that they're like the backward dog in Russian folklore, because they wag their tail at strangers and bark at their own family. And why the green movement is so hostile to fossil fuels in the West, and so blind to the rapid development of coal and oil in China, or, and Russia becoming, as somebody uh, <laughs> unkindly put it, that uh, Russia has become a gas station for China. Um, Shiv Majumdar said that, and that's a great line. Um, but there's something weirdly disloyal. And again, I don't say conspiratorial. I just say it's a matter of sort of attitude and of, of, of loathing of one's own civilization that is very dangerous. So all of these things converge to say it is time for people not to be bullied, but to take a really clear-eyed, broad look at the supposed science behind the climate emergency and the net zero response and ask themselves, is this really happening? And is the plan that we're being told we must adopt actually going to do us more harm than good? Because if the whole thing isn't happening or if the response isn't going to work, then we shouldn't do it. And that just seems to be a perfectly common sense thing we ought to be able to discuss without shouting insults. Absolutely. Um one one point I wanted to make is that um, there's a former European bureaucrat by the name of Samuel Ferfari, and he argues in a recent article that the EU leadership is completely naive when it comes to China and the environment, and that the EU leaders believe that the Chinese Communist Party is actually going to follow the net zero decarbonization urbanization path, that the EU is just leading the way. And with uh, the great infrastructure of the Belt and Road Initiative and whatnot, it's just a matter of building that infrastructure. And then China will definitely follow Europe's lead and um, that they'll lower their emissions after 2030 and whatnot. And for he, he, just, he just had such sort of disgust with um with the European leaders for for being so naive and that you know, he's like they're they're completely just turning a blind eye to the millions of Chinese engineers and businesses that are acquiring hydrocarbon assets around the world and that they're willfully ignoring the unceasing expansion of hydrocarbons in China itself and other developing countries. So if you look at the different railroads and the different superhighways and whatnot that they're building throughout Africa, accessing different ports. Um, solidifying the the different pipelines they, like you said, for Russia to be the gas station for China. They're also cooperating with Russia in the Arctic, which no one's talking about very much. And, and the, you know, Russia has their, their nuclear icebreakers that go around and, and take ships through and so on. And Europe is just, oh, okay, well, eventually China will be on board. We'll just lead by example. Yeah, which is, is interesting. It is very naive. I remember at one point in the in the early 80s, a German chancellor finally kind of woke up, was one of the social democrats, but he said, why are all the missiles in the east and all the protesters in the west? But again, it was it was a bit late to come to this realization. But it's also, as Matt Ridley recently said, it's incredibly arrogant. There's almost a white man's burden about this. The Europeans think, well, of course, we are leading the world because we are us and they are them. And so we will do this. And those silly yellow people will say, oh, look what white men do. I must do that, too. And of course, the Chinese are going, ha, 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 what a bunch of useful idiots. Uh, but it, it is it's an astonishing uh, mix of, of naivete and arrogance. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the one thing I just want let the Chinese invest in all this stuff and then we can just nationalize it and take all their capital away from them when the war starts, you know, when they invade Taiwan or something. Um, but the uh, capacity of Democratic leaders and to some extent voters to be naive about the existence of real hostility in the world, because back in the environmental movement, of course, didn't start with climate change. It started in the early 60s with Rachel Carson, Silent Spring and, you know, the Cuyahoga River bursting into flames and stuff. And so the environmental movement was very, very harsh about capital and what it did to the planet. And as a result, of course, we cleaned up our act. So there was, there was actually a silver lining there. But they were never worried about what the Soviets were doing to their environment. And when the Berlin Wall fell, we realized that there was an 11 time zone toxic waste dump out there. Um, and they're doing the same thing again with China. They're, they're naive about it, its economics. They're naive about its human rights record. They're naive about its environmental record. And they're naive about its geopolitical ambitions. And the amazing thing about Western societies is that we somehow muddle through. Like we we have survived for thousands of years because our adversaries have been even worse idiots than we are. Um, and that's not a good plan. It may be the only plan we've got right now. But again, yeah, if people were to start reading up on, on what's going on in China, I mean, to read the newspapers, but also, I mean, these Canadian senators saying, oh, Canadians shouldn't criticize China. Our human rights record is bad as theirs. You know, Chinese like their government and so on and so on. And the thing is, the, the man just, he just, he sounds like he's a fool. He's such a fool. It's like, you, you don't realize that you're, uh, you know, the, the sheep's clothing is slipping. Um, and so I think in the end, the Chinese, like the Soviets, will will topple themselves to their own stupidity, but only if we're sufficiently resolute. Remember, eventually the Americans did elect Ronald Reagan. And it was amazing. Because, you know, Reagan, he's such an idiot. He's a fool. He's senile. He's a goof. He's an actor and so on. And when, when he uh, said that communism was going to end up on the rubbish heap of history, they didn't even realize that he was sort of um, prankishly quoting Trotsky. But by golly, it happened. And so we need to wake up to the menace. We need to wake up to what we're doing to ourselves. And we need to get back to Magna Carta. I'm going to return to where we started the podcast. We need to remember that it is liberty that made us prosperous. It is liberty that made us safe. It is liberty that made us a tolerant, open society that attracts immigrants from around the world. And that it is on liberty that the West will stand or from liberty that the West will fall. And uh, that is why Magna Carta, our shared legacy of liberty. I wish every time somebody arrived in Canada, somebody immigrates to Canada, no matter where they're from, they go through the citizenship ceremony, they should be given a copy of Magna Carta and said, now it's yours, please help us take care of it. Because it is why you wanted to come to Canada. Uh, and if we could get back to that and to recognize that China is a communist tyranny, I, mean, I wish the Chinese people could be free of communism. It's, when we say China, we mean the Chinese Communist Party. And one more detail, I'm going to go into that video, that the People's Liberation Army, the largest military in the world, is not an organ of the Chinese government. It is a branch of the Chinese Communist Party. And if that doesn't tell you what sort of regime you're dealing with, you are, I don't know if you're useful or not, but you sure are an idiot. Well, that's a really important point, because when geopolitics and national security almost never enter the equation when they start talking about net zero and the energy transition and so on. So we have the Chinese Communist Party with at its disposal the largest army in the world. And let's say that they've invested in all these different assets in Canada. And so some attack happens on Taiwan and there's some kind of war would would Canada even try to um, nationalize whatever assets that the Chinese had? Would they try to seize them? Because I think there's probably a lot of Chinese in Canada right now. Well, yeah, but there's a lot of Chinese in Canada who are like, thank goodness I'm in Canada. Right? It's like when they talk, you know, they do polls on Canada Day and they find that, you know, a bunch of white progressives want to cancel it. And a bunch of immigrants are like, are you kidding me? This is the land that gave me freedom. Um and uh, so I think that, uh, and the other thing, you know, after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Franklin Roosevelt said, in, in genuine bathroom, he said, what kind of people do they think we are? And of course, it was partly his fault for allowing them to persist in their misconceptions for so long. But when the Chinese make their attacks at lunge, when, when they go for Taiwan, um, they're going to discover that the West is both stronger and freer, even now. As Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And the, the Canadian people will wake up. They'll wake up before their government does. That's a traditional pattern. And then they will back strong measures. But the problem we will find to some extent is that we are not able to respond because our military is so weak. 
On the other hand, you know, when we started World War II, we had six tanks and we literally had soldiers on maneuvers pointing sticks at each other and shouting bang. And I used to know a guy, of course, now dad, who was involved in D-Day, but who joined the military in the in the late 30s. And he had some stories to tell, like being sent down to guard Vancouver Beach against a Japanese invasion with three colleagues in a tent and a couple of rusty rifles. And when he was ordered to go down there. He said to his uh, commanding officer, OK, so if, if the Japanese actually show up, like if the invasion force appears, who are the backup? And the officer said, Reg, there's no backup. You four hold them off. Um, and yet, of course, we, <laughs> we did manage to rally. But why we would leave ourselves in such a position? And again, you know, the British Ministry of Defense has said it's going to go to net zero. I don't know if they have solar power jet fighters or something. Now, I'll tell you what, the Chinese military is not going to net zero. They're going to net 100-year marathon. Well, you made that interesting point where there's there'll be this dichotomy where China will be full on with their hydrocarbons and the West will not which puts us in what kind of position when the 100-year marathon reaches its end and China is the sole global power? I mean, is it a new type of, I, I've read or I've heard about this book by by Joel Corton called The New Feudalism, or is it a new socialism with Chinese characteristics? I mean, clearly the West will be in an inferior position than the the rulers of the developing world because i mean india is not going off hydrocarbons brazil isn't russia certainly isn't so if it's just the west what sort of future system is there and we're well, in this inferior position well that we we would be wishing for feudalism i won't give my terrible middle ages speech right now but feudalism was a, a system that respected liberty and uh preserved order in a most remarkable manner. Uh, and that's not what we would get from Xi Jinping and his successors by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that I'm an adjunct professor at Augustine College, and I teach this history of Western civilization. And for the last 2,000 years, really, uh, the dominant power in the world has also been the freest country. Rome, for all its failings, was a much freer society that Kibus Romanus Sum, the actual existence of the protection of law, even for somebody like uh, the Apostle Paul, um, stood out in, in the world. And then, of course, power gradually went to Western Europe and then, you know, particularly to the English speaking world. And then you had Britain and the Pax Britannica. And then you had the Pax Americana. And people have no idea what a world would be like in which freedom was not the dominant authority. I mean, people go on and on about, about racial injustice and not without cause, right? Racial slavery was the most, one of the most horrifying institutions in, in the history of the human race. But the British Empire didn't just abolish slavery within its frontiers. The British Empire sent its navy to abolish slavery in foreign countries. And the American Navy was helping them do it even before the United States abolished slavery. Who else ever did that? You think China would do that? It's a world dominated by an unfree dictatorship. Uh, I mean, you, you just have to look at the faces I remember somebody talked about the Brezhnev generation, these reptilian faces that they had uh, because of the evil deeds they had done or been complicit in all their lives. Uh, it, that would be a nightmarish world. I only hope that Victor Davis Hanson's carnage and culture will prove to be true, that the freedom has hidden strengths and tyranny has hidden weaknesses, and we know them better than they know us. Um, I mentioned about Pearl Harbor and that, what kind of people do they think we are? The architect of the Pearl Harbor attack, Admiral Yamamoto had actually lived in the United States and he did have some idea and he opposed the attack. He said, we will just awaken a sleeping dragon, but people who didn't know the United States wouldn't listen to him. And Xi Jinping, um, he does not actually understand the West. And to some very real extent, he doesn't understand China because nobody dares tell him. Nobody can <laughs> tell him bad news. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should be complacent. That means that we should be vigilant in defense of liberty. Um, there is, uh, I, and I mentioned this in the documentary too, and uh, at the time of the American Revolution, the state seal of Massachusetts has a guy who looks like the New England Patriots mascot. And he's got a sword in one hand and a scroll in the other. And if you look closely, the scroll says on it, Magna Charta. 
And that is, you know, it was good enough for King Alfred, even before Magna Carta. You know, it was good enough for uh, Queen Elizabeth I. It was good enough for the Duke of Wellington. It was good enough for Winston Churchill. And it's good enough for me. That is, it, That has got to be our stand. It's got to be that Magna Carta is the foundation of our liberty. And we will defend it in our civilization uh, rhetorically, intellectually. And if we have to, we will fight for it. That's very good summary. And just before we end, I just wanted to get your impression about some things that I've identif identified as inversions of our sort of shared cultural heritage and also um, our societal, uh, some key things about our geopolitical society. So, so on the one hand, we have Prince Charles's Terra Carta, which is this insulting inversion of the Magna Carta. And then there's what the G the new Atlantic Charter that the G7 came up with, which is just a risible affront to the original Atlantic Charter. And if this is an example of the type of framing for a reimagined global institutional structure, then like you said, we should not allow it. We have to say no, that this is really unacceptable and they, that they're just distorting and inverting all that has been good in our society. And making a terrible job of it, too. I, I reminded a line of Plunkett from Tammany Hall about some reform commission which said, could a search party find it now? Right. Magna Carta, when you think of its magnificence and its enduring importance and, you know, Churchill's magnificent rhetoric around it. If you're going to produce something you claim is the next Magna Carta, you better produce something stunning, including in its brevity, in its clarity, in its compelling moral qualities, as opposed to, boy, that Terra Carta was just read like it had been created by a UN committee. And, and I put, you know, a search party will not be able to find it in three years. Again, the New Atlantic Charter, compared to the, the, the depth and clarity of thought of the people who created the original one, um, th this stuff is, uh, you know, that thing about standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, right now we are standing on the shoulders of dwarves. Uh, these, these people are not uh, Stephen Langton. These people are not Winston Churchill. These people are not Sir Walter Raleigh. They are not Sir Edward Cook. They are nothing like these people. And if they don't know it, um, I, I feel a vague sense of pity for them making themselves so ridiculous. Um, but you know what? We don't need a new Magna Carta. We need the original Magna Carta. Um, it, it's all there. Women's rights are in there. No taxation without representation is there. No uh, trial except by a jury is in there. Um, no taking of property without compensation is in there. Um, that is the foundation of our liberty, and there's only one kind of liberty. The freedom of the church is in there. People often forget, but the, the prime mover of Magna Carta was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, uh, an astonishingly important historical figure. Who We should erect a statue to him. If we must pull down statues, let's put up one to Stephen Langton in their place. Um, because, yeah, that, that stuff is just, oh, it, it, it embarrasses me. I wouldn't dare write a new Magna Carta. Um, luckily, I don't need to. But but when they try and fail, you just think, who who told you you were the person to do this? What on earth? You know, I, I, maybe I should end with the story of King Canute, because Canute always gets this razzed for having thought he could stop the tides. But that's not true. That is a complete misrepresentation. What happened is that Canute's advisors told him that he was so mighty and so wise and so beloved of God that he could command the waves. So he said, OK, well, let's take my chair down to the sea and do some evidence based decision making. And he sat there and the waves came in and he said, halt. And they kept coming in and poured into his boots. And he stood up and he said to advisors, don't flatter me. I'm the king. I get flattery on the cheap all day long. I need you to tell me what I'm doing wrong, because otherwise, how can I govern properly? And he said, do not forget, there is only one who can command the tides, and that is God. So it's actually a story about humility and about a ruler determined not to get too big for his britches. Um, or King Alfred, who boasted that he had not made very many laws because he didn't think himself wise enough to change the traditional way that his people had lived. Um, this is a model of government that works and that we need to get back to. And it's a model of government that if we adhere to it, we will absolutely reject the Chinese Communist Party's vision of their future and of ours. I think that's a really important point to end on, because, you know, if this assault is stopped, you know, with the net zero and the energy transition and the, the, the Chinese hundred year marathon, I think our system really needs to be restored to its original core principles. And what you've just outlined is is exactly what we need to sort of restore. And 
I'm still waiting for some nice articulate person to encapsulate all this and and present it to the public in a way that they can, you know, get behind it and and ask and fight for it. Go, well, go to johnrobson.ca and look under documentaries for the Magna Carta documentary because I may not be what you just described, but I did give it my best shot, and the documentary is free. So if you hate it enough to demand your money back, you just have to stop watching and you get it. But I really, uh, I do think that it lays out clearly why our way of life depends on Magna Carta and why Magna Carta is a dependable basis for a good life. That's a good place to end. And I, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me about these issues. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>